It's a great pleasure to introduce another guest to our festival interviews, um, Colin White, who has a book all about Rolexes. Um, Colin, tell us about your book. Well, thank you very much for making the time to, to have me join you and your audience. Um, I have completed a rather long piece of work on a book entitled The Vintage Rolex Field Manual. This is a, a, an expanded, extended uh, edition based on a, what was a pet project that I had been working on for a couple of years. And I've been lucky enough to be actually get this to market this, this summer. Despite all of the, uh, the things going on in the world, um, this may not be the best time to be looking at vintage Rolex, but the book is finally here. Okay, um, but, but Rolexes, what, what was your first Rolex? You know, um, probably uh, in my teens, I acquired a two-tone Datejust. This would have been in the 80s. Um, they've somewhat gone out of collector's fashion uh, these days, but um, I certainly remember it fondly. Okay, um, and uh, so, so your collection changes over time, I imagine. So do, do you have a favorite watch in your collection at the moment? Um, Yes, my collection definitely evolves over time, and it hasn't always been Rolex, and it's certainly not exclusively Rolex. Um, in, in terms of the, the Rolex I own today, um, I'm still awfully partial to the, the, the older references, particularly the four-digit references uh, from the 1950s. One of my favorites is a, is a 6518. This is a 34 millimeter um, white dialed, early Rolex, one of the earliest with the, the self-winding perpetual movement. Um, they go rather unnoticed these days. I, th I think most collectors are, uh, you know, want the, the Submariner 5513 or, or maybe a, a GMT 1675. So there are many of these four digit references from the 50s that, that can be had in pretty good condition for very reasonable money these days. I'm, I'm going to have to ask that. What, what and reasonable money, for example, means? Um, if we're looking at the uh, the manual wind, uh, they're often marked on the dial as precision or, or super pre precision. Um, you can have these for for a couple of thousand US dollars. Um, they're they're a great jumping off point to to get into early vintage Rolex. Um, many of them have been been refinished, so you know that, that's part of the, the fun. Go out and find one that you think not only that you like cosmetically, but you would hope is in as honest and original condition as you can find. Um, and then once you acquire one, um, you probably want to get a, a watchmaker to look it over and make sure it's running fine and pressure test it, make sure it's waterproof. Um, once you've done that, they will serve as a daily wearer, uh, very practical, very comfortable to wear, and will, will keep you on time throughout your day. All right, okay. Um, and um, um, th but thinking about watches that maybe you don't yet have, is there any, is there, do you have a grail watch? Is there a grail Rolex that you don't Maybe yet? it's a sign of age, but um, I think a lot of collectors, particularly in the Rolex circuit, slowly seem to move up the scale going from these sort of classic stainless steel sort of sports watches to um, probably the precious metal um, uh, sports models. Um, I, you know, as I get older, I'm becoming more and more attracted to the solid gold Submariner, the 16, uh, 16808, you know, the blue dial thing. It's probably a little bit out of my reach right now, maybe a little bit, a bit of an extravagant buy, but, um, those are certainly things that are on my radar as I think are very collectible. Um, they were made in far fewer uh, numbers um, and are increasingly difficult to find in, in a honest condition. Uh, certainly over the years, this goes for the solid gold GMTs too. Um, quite often the bracelets will have been sold off for their, their scrap metal value. So it's, mm. it's quite challenging to find a complete head and bracelet together, even more challenging to find one and complete with all its accessories and documents and boxes and the rest of it. Right, okay. Um, coming back to the book, what, what inspired you to write such a, such a book? You know, um, as I've been going about my collecting journey, and I think other collectors will experience this too, you, you wind up acquiring a lot of non-watch related things, often things like auction catalogs, um, interesting advertisements from magazines, other books, um, 
it's very difficult to, to collate all of that material in, and condense it down into something that's useful when you're actually going out and looking for, for uh, to acquire another watch. So part of what I undertook was to try to consolidate all of this into something that was useful as a reference manual. Um, you know, when you're looking at the date just, there are countless date just references. Um, this, this has been made in countless combinations uh, for decades now. And so having a reference that you can turn to to check to see whether this particular date just was made with this colored dial, with this bezel combination, um, that can be a very um, challenging exercise to verify a watch like that. So part of the mot motivation was just to consolidate and condense all this information into something that was practical and useful. Okay. Um, Sorry. I'm a big fan of watch books in general, but they tend to be, um, they tend to be these very high production quality uh, coffee table books, beautiful photographs, macro pictures of sort of elite condition, you know, uh, uh, pieces that have, have never seen a sweaty wrist before. <laughs> uh, and while they are wonderful to look at, um, they're usually out of reach for most average collectors. Um, so my interest was, was really being able to, to assess things that are out there that average people like you and me are seeing in, you know, jewelers' windows, circulating on eBay, out on the watch forums, being able to kind of understand whether they're legitimate, authentic, and whether they've been messed around with or not. So that, that was the impetus and the, impetus and the driver for, for producing a, a book like this. Okay, wow. So as my, my next question, I think it's, it's got two elements to it. And um, so as I understand, having the book in hand or, or studying the book will help me going to like sort of like an, not to an authorized dealer to, to sort of other places where I might want to buy a watch. And also, I mean, how will it help me to identify what it is that I'm looking for or what it is that I'm looking at? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, firstly, authorized dealers tend, tend not, and I'm generalizing a little bit, but they tend not to be great sources of vintage pieces. Now, there are some excellent retail outlets that, that uh, retail jewelers that specialize in, in vintage Rolex. Um, so even if you were to go to one of those, how do you determine whether a piece that they, they, they have to offer you is fairly priced? Um, how do you determine whether a dial is a service dial, or whether it's got service hands or not? Um, those are sorts of questions that you need to, to answer to satisfy yourself in order to be able to understand whether an asking price is fair. Um, you know, I talked about some of these very high value precious metal pieces, the solid gold pieces. Um, obviously, they command very large price tags, but and if you're going to be spending that kind of money, you want to know whether those are service hands or whether that's a service crown. Um, while the, 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 the salesperson in the jewelers might insist that it's absolutely authentic and completely original, you need to satisfy yourself. And there are small cues that you should learn to look for um, in order to be able to inform your buying decisions. So that's really what I was trying to, to help other collectors with, jumpstart that learning process to help them be able to assess and look at a piece before spending very considerable sums of money in some cases. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, I personally don't yet own a Rolex. I think you already know, I, I have a Tudor watch, uh, which I'm a big fan of. What yep. would be a good starting point for Rolex in your opinion? Um, it depends very much on who you are. If you're a young, a young collector dipping your toe into Rolex, we talked about those early uh, four digit references from the 50s. They're absolutely beautiful and they're very robust um, and they're very practical. Um, if you're a little older, uh, perhaps like myself, um, with perhaps a little bit more disposable income to be looking to be playing with, um, the, the stainless steel sports references have been hot for some time. And the reason for that is that they hold their value pretty well. Um, they, they, they were made in large volumes from probably the late 50s through to the, the 70s. And so some of them are are available in sort of collector's packages, complete with the, the papers and the boxes and all the accessories that, that, that go with them. So certainly the, uh, the Submariners and the GMTs are, um, are usually a first stopping point for collectors with a bit more disposable income. Um, these are people who are willing, you know, comfortably able to drop maybe $10,000 on a watch and upwards. 
um, depending on what we're looking at. Now, if obviously you're into you're a military historian buff and you, know, you want a military uh, issued Submariner, then that's a whole different niche that, that has its own, you know, uh, exorbitant prices in some cases. Um, but, but that's a good starting point for the middle market. Now, if, you, if you're an elite collector at the very high end, um, you're probably traveling the world to, to watch auctions, um, in which case uh, there are some very special pieces that, that can be had at auction. Particularly some of those with, with, with you know, uh, complications, much like the, sort of the early uh, triple dates and the Jean-Claude Killies and, and some of these um, very unusual and rare pieces. There you're, you're dropping north of $50,000 easily. All right. Okay. So we we, we got different entry levels or, or, or beginners levels depending on how much. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to help newer collectors with with this book. You know, where where do you enter the market? And how do you enter the market? What are some of the pitfalls? Um, and hope the feedback so far from other collectors has been very warm and very generous and very encouraging. And so I'm hoping your audience and uh, will will find some value in this. Okay, well, I've, I've, I've got an idea. I think um, you very kindly suggested that you were going to send our association a copy of the book, but maybe what we can do, maybe not right now, it might be a bit quick, but if you could think of a question to um, pose to our viewers and our fans, uh, maybe we could use your question and um, the most or the, the first, or like, we'll have to come to that up with the details, could get that copy of the book. How does that sound to you? Wonderful idea. Wonderful idea. Yes. Um, let, let me think of something fun that, um, that a collector could probably find with a little hunting on the internet um, that, that's relevant to the story we're telling in the book. Okay, super. Um, and of course, there will be links to uh, your book and uh, like the, the, the web page where people can find because I also understand it's available in PDF uh, format. Is that correct? It's actually available as a digital edition. It's not a PDF. It's actually an EPUB that you can uh, get through the, the Apple Bookstore or if you're an Android user through Google Play Books. So there is a, a digital edition for, for the, the more um, sort of tablet-oriented uh, readers. Okay. Sorry about the PDF thing. I'm still winding no, up. No, it's quite all right. There's a lot a common misconception. But yeah, the, the EPUB is um, it's easier to navigate. It's a, it's a sort of fair representation of what the, the print book is. Um, so those that like to read on their iPads and tablets, yes, that, that's available too. All right. Okay, super. So um, probably by the time that this video is published, We'll have the question already set out. Maybe by the time that some people are watching it, the, the, the book will already have been won by someone. Um, so, Yeah, I mean, the book is available on Amazon um, pretty much in every territory. Uh, if you want to come and buy it directly from me, from the author's website, uh, www.vrfm.io. Um, and if you like, I can try to personalize it. You know, I can't, I can't always ship them quickly to, to, to the end users, but certainly it doesn't hurt to ask. All right. Wow. That, that, I'm sure we're, we're, I'm going to be jealous of the person who wins the hard copy of the book here in Poland. Um, but uh, Colin White, thank you very much for taking some time to speak to us um, and joining us in, in our festival. We're, we're very much looking forward to seeing you virtually or who knows, even live here in Poland next year. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You're gonna, you're gonna be my lover tonight. Take it with, take it with me, take it with me. Mm -hmm.